Hi, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. We are unmuted. I'm looking at the green bar. And guess who's back today? Yay! <laughs> so how was it in the carpool lanes last Monday afternoon, honey? <laughs> you know, when your youngest child is 31, you forget. You forget yeah. that whole thing. Yeah. So, um, no, it was all great. It was all yeah. fine. Really, Were the carpool lanes at, like, Prince of Peace or Rosemead ever that long to wait in? I suspect they were, it was just a much smaller school, yeah, so yeah. the lines weren't so long as... Not quite as long, but it's yeah. okay. It really... Worked out fine. It really was fine. It was great. It was great. The, I boy, had, the boys survived four days with us, and we survived four days, four with, days them. with them. <laughs> <laughs> with these budding teenagers. Well, one is a full-blown teenager, yes. and one is is. We did make quick more stops at McDonald's than we normally would have. Oh, my gosh, And we yes. had more pizza than we would have. Oh, my gosh, yes. <laughs> but anyway... Everybody, glad to be back. And as you guys know, like today, we're wrapping up. Tomorrow, uh, next Monday, excuse me, Scott and I won't be here because we are just incredibly excited about going to um, our vacation. So there we are. See, no class next week. No class next week. September Yay! 6th, no, right? Yes. 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 Um, since COVID started, we have left Dallas twice. One was to go to MD Anderson <laughs> That's kind a fun of trip. That facility for Scott to have some scans done and well, to meet really with the to, specialist. You know, yeah, we just really got, got went down there for a second opinion, didn't we? Yes. And then one year later, we went four days to my sister's wedding in Florida, which was lovely. But we drove there. We drove back very quickly. And it was so hectic when we were there every every day yeah. that we were doing yeah. something. So this is our first real vacation since 2019. Yeah. Yeah. You're kind of like the gal in the commercial that is pounding, ends up pounding her iPad with her meat cleaver. Or we are going. How <laughs> <laughs> oh, silly. Okay. Man, oh, man. So, yeah. So um, next week, we're not going to be here. Today, we are going to wrap up Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah by taking the story from the end of Nehemiah all the way up to the story of Jesus because it is hundreds of years from Nehemiah to Jesus. And so then uh, when we are back on the 13th for Monday afternoon, we're going to start something new. And what we're going to start new are the letters of Paul, First and Second Timothy and Titus. These are letters from Paul written to people, not places, as you can tell by the name. And Timothy and Titus are both working companions of, of, of Paul. And so we kind of call this Paul's letters to the next generation. And that's... Do you want you know, to tell them why that was what we ended up calling it? Okay, go ahead. There's honey. a very official name to this. Okay, they're, if you're going to deal with these, you call them. They're called the pastoral epistles. So I decided we get a, a lot of people who we have no idea who they are that actually listen to these podcasts and watch the YouTubes, and I thought that sounds so. Um, I don't even know. Boring? No, kind of. <laughs> and I was like, Scott, really? So tell me, like, exactly what is... To... And he said, well, you know, Paul's trying to give just advice to Timothy and to Titus, like, you know, to keep the ball rolling. This is what you got to do, passing it on to the next... I said, well, why don't we call it that? Because it's like advice. And, you know, we all hope in our lives that people we love and trust give us good advice. And then right. hopefully we pass it on to somebody right. else. And this was basically what Paul was doing. He knew he was really old. He knew he was not going to be around forever. And he wanted to make sure that especially Timothy was a really young guy that, that he got yep. it. Yep. And that he so, got it right. So anyway. Yeah. That and, was, and there's some famous passages like love... The love of money is the root of all evil. That comes from First Timothy. Wow. All scripture is God breathed and yeah. is useful for teaching, wow. rebuking, correcting, and training righteousness. Comes from Second Timothy. And there's some controversial passages dealing with women and so forth, as is often the case. And we'll talk about those. But yeah, so we're going to start that journey next Monday afternoon. No, not next Monday. Patty's <laughs> eyes are. She's going. No, 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 Scott. <laughs> Um, next, a week from Monday, yes, right at yes. 3 p.m. The 13th. The 13th. The 13th. And then after, I think after we finish that, we will go 
to the Old Testament. I just wanted more New Testament time right now. That's yes. really what I and wanted. And on this, that very same week, the very next day, on Tuesday, September 14th, we will be finished up with our Tuesday class, and that will start the Gospel of John. Yep. So. That's exactly right. All righty, honey. So, Why very you good. Want me to open us up with a prayer? Yeah, strong prayer today. A lot's going on in the world, so there make is a nice, indeed. strong prayer. Gracious Lord, in this world in which we are reminded so often of human folly and sin and, and uh, troubles, and we just, just pray that um, you will uh, guard us in this time that we've set aside here to come together and to study your word. We come here as your disciples, striving to, to hear your word better so that we can live your word better um, and better understand our place and our purpose in this world and the next. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All righty. All righty, Patty. So, well, my friends, where we left it was at First Peter chapter 5. We were writing these opening verses about the elders and the shepherds and so forth. And I thought really what we ought to do is just go right back there because it really is part of the stuff that follows. So, um, and I did... Uh, bring some more materials on the shepherds, which I talked about in my Sunday class a few weeks ago, but it's really, it's just one of the dominant themes in Scripture, one of the dominant ways of understanding both God and the kings of Israel and the Messiah and Jesus and the leaders of Israel. So, yeah, so we're going to do a little bit of that as well. So, let's just Go back a few verses. We'll start at the first verse of chapter 5. And if you have anything you want to add, just, just, just throw it on in. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering. So this is Peter talking about himself. He is an elder. He's an older guy at this point. This is probably in the early 60s AD, which would probably make him um, 60 years more himself, um, figuring he was roughly a contemporary of Jesus age-wise. Um, those who are willing to speculate about th such things think that that same thing is true of Paul, that Jesus, Peter, Paul were all men... Um, uh, of roughly the same age. And so Peter is now, you know, he is an elder and he's an elder in the church. And he says, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, um, a leader um, in the larger church. And there are leaders, elders, which is, which is, I think, really um, an age and experience thing in the church. Um, there in in, in Turkey, where these letter, this letter is being written to the house churches. I appeal to you as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. So he doesn't set himself apart from those to whom he's writing. He is with them. They are all going to share in the glory to be revealed. What What is that? To be revealed in Christ. Glory is something that can't be seen, and the whole world will see it when Jesus returns the second time. And the kingdom of God is made 100% visible, 100% manifest, um, uh, wrapping over and, and, and banishing um, sin and darkness and so forth from this world. So he's writing to the elders, and he, here's what he wants to say to them in verse 2. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Watching over them, not because you must. We talked about this last week. Not because you must, but because you are willing. Of course God wants a willing heart. He wants willing hands. He doesn't want people dragged into this. Who would? <laughs> right? Not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. 
not lording it over those entrusted to you, dot, 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 as the Gentiles do, but being examples to the flock. So let's talk about this whole shepherd flock business. If you are um, in my Sunday class, you'll recognize some of this um, as repetitive of what we did a few weeks ago, but it's good for you. It's good for you because it's just... It's, it's just so important. Old Testament and New. So I'm going to switch to the slides for a few minutes here. Go forward to this. This is a slide that I used in my class. This is one of the kings of, of Samaria. From, from before. This is before the time of Abraham, right? 2100 BC. That's, I don't know, 300 years before Abraham. He's a king. Samaria had been a people and a civilization and a kingdom for at least a millennium going back into 3000 BC and before ancient 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 and on the king's head is what a crown no a shepherd's cap because a theme that isn't restricted to the Israelites alone is the idea that the kings were to be shepherds and what do shepherds do they take care of their people. They guard the flock. They look over the flock. They see that the flock is fed and that the flock is watered. And that becomes such an important um, uh, theme in the Old Testament and the New. Here's another relief. You can see the Sumerian king there with his shepherd's cap on as compared to the other guy who's got... I don't know, it looks like a Christmas tree on his head, but I don't think that's what it is. Some sort of crown. So, of course, shepherds work differently in different parts of the world, but they have the same purpose. You know, sheep are so domesticated that, they, that they're not really able to take care of themselves. They don't, they can't guard themselves against predators, wolves, bears, and such things. They don't, they, they, they can't really make their way to the grazing and, and water. They have to be cared for. They have to be cared for. And that is the dominant image of the shepherds. And you could say, well, good golly, you know, I don't really need to be cared for in that way. Hmm. We're inclined, we might be inclined to say something like, like that until something really hits us in this world. This world is a world filled with lots of suffering and lots of troubles. And look at all, look what's happening right now to the people in Louisiana and Mississippi and all these folks who are being, have been devastated by the latest hurricane. They do need help. They've been told to shelter in place. They're gonna run out of food and water. They do need help from their neighbors and the rest. Sure, of, of course. So when we are struck ill, when we are trying to make our way through a world that that is filled with anger and and greed and lust and sin of of course we need help that's the idea is that god is the one who will provide that help provide that caring um and uh, in turn it will be the kings of israel who provide that so let me go back to my slides you know one of the great examples of the shepherd kings is, of course, David, who began as a shepherd. When Samuel discovered, well, when Samuel discovers that David is to be the next king of Israel, and when he goes to David's household and learns that all the brothers are not, but that David is, David is a shepherd boy who became king. And um, we might, I think, turn to Psalm 23. Why not? It's a beautiful Tuesday. It's a beautiful you psalm. Said, I have to tell you, honey. Yes. Jim Adams corrected you online about that. Today is Monday. What did I just say? It's Tuesday. Oh! You've you said it before. <laughs> you are wishful thinking for Saturday. I, I don't know. know. <laughs> Could be. What's that? What's that? TGIS? Then? No. It's Monday. Monday, 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 Monday. Oh, man. Okay. So turn to the 23rd Psalm in your Bibles. See, when I did this in my class, almost nobody, nobody had Bibles, so it, this is helpful to see it ourselves. So this is from, I'll read it from the NIV. 
it is a, you'll notice at the top there is a designation. This is a Psalm of David, right? And it focuses on God as the shepherd. And so David wrote this. He said, Yahweh is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You being God, Yahweh, Lord, your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. This is just talking about all the blessings pouring out upon, upon David from God, who is his who is his provider and loves him and cares for him. Verse 6, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. Right, it's just the most famous of all psalms, built around what? God as, as the shepherd. So, um, it's just just no surprise that that, that, that psalm, still you know resounds to this day it's just it's robert hasley's favorite i imagine that's true for many many people the lord is my shepherd but the metaphor goes further than that so turn in your bibles well, you now we got them all open and stuff i think hopefully so anyway these what we do here on mondays and tuesdays it's monday today Will work a lot better um, with with Bibles open. So here we go. This is the one of the themes in Jeremiah. This is when things are falling apart. Jeremiah is prophesying, bringing God's word as everything is falling apart. There were just we're just a couple of decades if that much, from the destruction of Jerusalem and the loss of the temple and the Babylonian exile and the whole world caving in. And, and, and here is the way God describes it. 23 verse 1, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares Yahweh. Therefore this is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Those are the leaders of Israel that God is talking about here. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and I have and have not bestowed care on them. In other words, you have failed at your job. I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares Yahweh. I myself, God himself is going to do it. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and they will no longer be afraid or terrified nor will any be missing. The, the, whole, the whole paragraph is, is, you know, in Jeremiah is focused on the work of the shepherds and using that metaphor to describe God the leaders of the people and the people themselves and it 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 ties so well to Jesus right who who's, who's certainly the good shepherd but it ties to the condemnation that Jesus pronounced upon the leaders of Israel in his day when he tore into the temple courtyards and overthrew the money lenders table and accused and invoked the words of Jeremiah saying you've turned this into a den of thieves it is the leaders of Israel who have led the people away from God rather than toward God and they and hence they have been bad shepherds okay so one more well, just just to show you, I'm just want to show you how pervasive this is. Turn to the book of Ezekiel. In the 34th chapter, the really the whole chapter is devoted to it. We will, of course won't read the whole chapter. I don't think. Um, but you need to hear. 
<laughs> the woe to the shepherds of Israel in this passage is describing what happened to Israel, right? And does say something about the responsibilities that the leaders take on when they become leaders, which we'll see when we get back to Peter. So just look at 34 verse 1. We'll just, we'll just do a little bit of this. The word of Yahweh came to me, Ezekiel. Time, this is when everything's falling apart, same time as Jeremiah, basically. Son of man, Ezekiel, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Yahweh says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, close yourselves with the wool, slaughter the choice animals, but you don't take care of the flock. You haven't strengthened the weak, healed the sick, or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals, right? All the peoples and nations around them. Just think of the ten lost tribes of Israel, just kind of lost, lost. Verse 6, my sheep wandered all over the mountains and on every hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. And so then God says that God himself is going to pick up that mantle and he will become their their shepherd. So all of which really comes to its culmination in the story of of Jesus. Right? So I have a question yeah. for you. There. Please please Patty. Um, because when you you said um, this is in the very beginning of this um, verse 2 son of man and yes. then you said Ezekiel um this, wasn't Son of Man the term that Jesus used most often to call himself? Yes. Okay, so that's kind of interesting then. Okay, so Son of Man, um, in the Greek version of the Old Testament, is Theos Anthropos, which means, um, well, it's Son of God, so it's just Hui Anthropos, Son of Man. And it was really just a way of saying, you human being. Okay. In Daniel 7, though, which was written after Ezekiel and was written a century, more than a century and a half before Jesus, in Daniel 7, the Son of Man is used, the phrase is used very particularly to refer to the one who, who is given authority by God to defeat the powers of this world and rule over God's creation. And, and when Jesus uses the phrase Son of Man to refer to himself, he is invoking that Daniel 7 figure. Okay. Not just using it more generally as, as a human being. It is tricky. It is tricky. So I'm glad you raised that. Okay. You know, yep, absolutely. So it is, it, so as you can imagine, <laughs> scholars fight about this stuff all of the time. You know, I, I just think it's plain as day that when Jesus calls himself son of man, he's not just doing it like it was used in reference to Ezekiel, a human being, but that is the figure of Daniel 7. Because the Daniel 7 is a messianic figure. The Daniel 7 is this, is this dramatic figure coming before the throne of God and giving dominion over all creation. That's who Jesus is. Not Ezekiel. That's who Jesus is. So how, how could it not be? And I think that everybody who heard Jesus refer to himself as the Son of Man, the first thing that would come to their mind would be that dramatic figure from Daniel 7 because they all wanted to be rescued from the clutches of the pagan oppressors which they had suffered under for so long. At least unless you were the rich and powerful in Israel, then you were happy. 
but for the crowds that gathered around Jesus, they were not the rich and powerful by any means. So does that help? That did help. Did help. Okay. Yes, awesome. So let's go back. That's, I've got to do this on my little iPad here. Go back to 1 Peter. Where is that? It's that, in the is, New Testament. Is that in the New the Testament? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so let me just put down my glasses. So any questions, Patty, or anybody about this whole shepherd thing? It is, again, it's not an image peculiar and unique to Israel. It comes from other ancient Near Eastern cultures as well. And, and it's really just a cool thing to stop and think that in these ancient cultures, there was there were those who looked first to a king to be the protector and provider for the king's people. That that that's the whole that's the whole idea, and and I think it's I think it's great. Well, if anybody had the opportunity to be in this last series we've been doing in our. Um, Sunday morning class at eleven. The lost. It was called Indiana Jones and the Lost. Images yeah, but Indy didn't didn't make Indy it. He never showed up. But yeah, anyway, which I was reminded of yesterday. This, so we spent a whole week on the one of the lost yeah, images as, as God being the shepherd. It's just so dominant. So. Sorry, Pat. Anything else? No. Hey, I, I just wanted to because I might forget light later. Today. I wanted to just, because I got a little message there, that actually tomorrow is Carl Reeve's 74th birthday, uh -huh. and the next day, it's their 54th wedding anniversary, Wow! which means they got married as youngins, and yes, congratulations on both of those things. That's, that's wonderful. Yes, and so, that's awesome. Awesome. Birthdays and anniversaries, same time. Big party. Big reasons for, to have a party, huh? Okay, so so let's let's look at this first paragraph in First Peter five. He's talking to the elders. He's using the metaphor of the shepherds of the flock. He's telling them, verse two, they're under your care. Watch over them. Don't pursue dishonest gain. You're there to serve them. That's what a shepherd does. His whole shepherd's whole existence is to look after and to serve the flock. Don't lord it over them, okay? Um, but be examples to the flock. Examples, it's, you know, it's being examples makes people uncomfortable. Um, Paul was wise about this. He, he knew that he was an example. And he wasn't, he, he wasn't embarrassed about it. I mean, he just said, he would say, imitate me as I imitate the Lord. Um, we, don't really, we don't really get to choose whether we will be examples to people or not. That's one thing I learned a long time ago. Scott, I do see yeah. that a question just popped yeah. up from Larry Rivera. Um, it says, the concept of the shepherd is so important. How did that profession become so lowly in Jesus' time? Because the shepherds were, the in, in practice, the idea of the king being a shepherd gets separated from the realities of shepherds being people who basically spend their lives with flocks of sheep and goats. And they basically have to live with those sheep and goats. And so it becomes uh, a life at the bottom of the economic heap, let me put it that way. Because it, it's not an attractive life. It's just not an attractive life. So, but, but of course, what, what happens when the angels come to announce the birth of Jesus, to whom do they go? Do they go to the kings? Mm -hmm. No. They go to the shepherds sitting in the hills with their flocks. They're the ones the angels come to. They come to the lowliest of the low, and that is a huge huge uh, reminder of of what of what God is doing in the world he is God is turning the world upside down and those at the very bottom of the heap 
are lifted are lifted up um, so it's I think a little bit later we'll, we'll be we'll be talking about yeah we'll be talking about this a little more because I have a thought I want to use but I'll wait till I plan to use it but I think that that's why it been get really I've actually known a few shepherds because when I, I used to work I spent a couple of summers in college working in Wyoming collecting samples of underground water driving all over the countryside by myself in these four wheel things and there were Basque sheep herders with the ho the horse and the little covered wagon kind of thing and they would be out there all the time with those sheep that was their life you know and every once in a while our paths would cross so yeah I think that's about the best I can do with that question so now back to first Peter verse 4 when the chief shepherd appears well we know who that is right who is the chief shepherd that's going to appear God. well that's yeah but particularly Jesus yes right think of John 10 Jesus says in one of the there are seven I am statements in John's gospel and one of them is I am the good shepherd Jesus says calling on all that shepherd imagery from the Old Testament and the metaphor. I am the good shepherd, he says. You know, yes, yeah, Psalm 23 is about, is about Yahweh. Yahweh, who is the shepherd looking over David. Now, Jesus says, I am the, the name of God. I am. I am the good shepherd. Right? And so now Peter refers to Jesus as the chief shepherd. Look back at, um, go back to chapter 2, verse 25. This is this whole little section in First Peter that we had a while back where Peter's drawing on the book of Isaiah, particularly, you know, specifically, the suffering servant passages. Um, let's just go back to verse 22 and hear it again. He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. From Isaiah 51. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. Retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Quote, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Another quote. For, quote, you were like sheep going astray. Another quote from Isaiah 51. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And who is that shepherd? That shepherd is Jesus. That, that's who Jesus, Jesus is the sheep. Jesus is the shepherd. Um, and in chapter 5, where we can go back to now, you know that he's talking about Jesus in particular, and not simply God as, simply, <laughs> not God as the sh chief shepherd, because he says, and when the chief shepherd appears. What are they waiting to have? They're what are they waiting to happen? They're waiting for Jesus to come back. Heck, we're waiting for Jesus to come back. I think it, Jesus's return is wow, getting dark here. It's um, Jesus's return is more his is more real to them. A greater sense of its imminence that I think faded as the years went by and then the centuries went by. And I think somehow we, we, we need to recapture some of that. You know, the, the, this whole story we tell, these claims we make about resurrection and a life after life after death and Jesus' return, we have to somehow make that real in our minds and our hearts and in our lives. And I think it's something you have to work on. This is my opinion. It's something you have to work on every day. Because the world is all the time trying to take that away. 
I just was asked in, in yesterday's class, which was a open Q&A to Patty, Lauren, and myself about this you know, Harvard University of all places. John Harvard will be spinning in his grave. Harvard University announcing that their next chaplain is going to be, is an atheist. I'm going, what a mockery. Yes. What an absurdity. You know, just one more mark of a world increasingly populated and ruled by fools who, who don't understand who God is and what God is doing in this world that person possibly help somebody through a problem or a crisis or his whole world well view I mean, you know would be I'm sure he's skewed. probably a, a therapist or something but this is the oh, chaplaincy I know it's not just like <laughs> it's a supposed to be like a spiritual crisis right. of course it's not new I remember about gosh this is looking back 30 years probably uh maybe not yeah maybe the the chaplain of Harvard University wrote a book entitled Finding your religion. And he didn't mean here are three choices. Pick. No, him constructing your own religion would have been a better choice, a more apropos title for the book. And so I guess that whole stream ends up with an atheist being named the chaplain of Harvard and God just God just weeping. Just just I oh my goodness. So anyway, and Verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the kind of glory that will never fade. Peter's always reminding these people who are suffering that yes, they are suffering in this life as Jesus suffered in this life. But this life is not all there is to their existence or to yours and mine. That these crowns of glory, their ways of talking about what awaits us um, after our deaths, right? Unless Jesus comes back first, but we've been through 2,000 years, so I'm, I'm, I don't have a, a clock ticking around it. So that's after our deaths, when everybody, one day, will be able to see, yes, 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 this is who Jesus is. Well, Steve Wilson said, I read that the atheist chaplain was Jewish. Well, that is an oxymoron. You can't be atheist and Jewish at the same time. That's not possible. Maybe he had been Jewish? I don't know. Maybe he had been Jewish. If he tried to describe himself as an atheist Jewish chaplain, <laughs> everybody from Abraham forward would be spinning in their graves. <laughs> and that's a lot of people <laughs> so okay enough of that so now now so he's spoken to the elders the leaders they're leaders by virtue of their maturity their age their experience they're to be examples right there's they there to the flock um and now he says in the same way you who are younger submit yourselves to your elders all he means is accept accept the leadership of these people who are older than you and have been doing this longer than you. Don't think you know everything. We we all submit ourselves to Christ, right? We all strive to to walk in Christ's way because he knows and Peter's saying okay you younger members in the same way right submit yourselves to your elders follow their leadership it's what they're it's it's why God has put them has put them there it's how it's how things work we learn from others we have mentors and mentee mentees is that a word we have, we have mentors and protégés and other things. Of course, that's how it works. You want to become a plumber. What do you do? I guess you get some training, but then you really need to, need to attach yourself to a really good plumber who will teach you 
how to do it and teach you the tips and tricks and all the rest of it of building a business and being a plumber. Sure, of course. He says, in the same way you who are younger submit yourselves to your elders, all of you close yourselves with what? Humility toward one another. Elders to younger, younger to others. Then he quotes from the Proverbs, maybe 334. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Calvin said, here's this thing I was going to, did, I didn't use earlier, but I could. Okay, so John Calvin said, imagine that, that God has two hands. Because, of course, God does not have hands. So imagine that God has two hands. And one hand has a big hammer in it that he uses to hammer down the proud and the arrogant, the ones who are shouting out, I am, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Right? And so he's hammering them back down into right, the, the right place. And with the other hand, God is picking up and sustaining the humble and the weak. It, 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 is, it is just like Jesus' parable about the um, Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee goes, Jesus tells a story about it. Pharisee goes in to the right into the temple and he's just telling God all these great things he's done and he's so righteous and he's done this and he's given this money and he's built this and he's done this and he's done all his prayers and he ate everything he ate he didn't eat anything he wasn't supposed to you know and and the while well, meanwhile the tax collector is back in the back sad and just saying to God basically I'm a sinner I'm a sinner. And then Jesus says, who, who leaves the temple righteous? And of course the answer is the tax collector. The tax collector who understands who he is in the scheme of things, who isn't, who isn't foolish. It's the, it's the Pharisee who is foolish. It's the Pharisee who's, who, 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 who is lifting himself up all the time very self-righteous, liking, enjoying walking through the crowds and getting all the adulation. Oh, there's a, look at him. He's really, he's just wonderful. And, and just soaking it all in. No, no. Proverbs 3.34, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humility is a dominant, a dominant theme in the New Testament. Of course it is. So verse 6, he says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, right? That he may lift you up in due time. Think, right? So you got this hand lifting, lifting up. That he may lift you up in due time. Humility. Humility is not a popular word in large sections of our culture today, right? It, it, it really has never been a popular word but it is becoming increasingly unpopular. Do you think that's true, Patty? Yes. I think it is. Uh, I, I think humility just seems like some old, antiquated, you know, kind of, oh, come on, old guy. We're going to talk about humility. Or, oh, what, we're going to start talking about lust and greed and, you know, pride and, the, oh, really? <laughs> I'll go away. So, anyway, verse 7. Peter writes, Cast all your anxiety on him, right? Because he cares for you. That's that's a verse that's used a lot, too. It is a verse that's used a lot. It's a, it's a nice verse. It's a lovely verse. I've seen it needle pointed a number of times and it needs to be put in the context of the shepherd mm -hmm. right yes. that he that god has been talking about he cares for you as the shepherd cast all your anxiety on him now is there a verse that is needle pointed more but lived less i don't think so you know and i, I can think back to the passage from um the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus at length talks about, do not worry, oh, no. right? The birds of the air, 
God feeds them. The flowers of the grass, God, God clothes. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And, but then there is that last verse that really explains it all. When Jesus says, strive first for the kingdom of God, right? And the righteousness of God will be added to you. In other words, strive first for the kingdom. Strive first for the kingdom and everything else will fall into place. Strive first for the kingdom. It's well, it's kind of like what I just said. Set about to train your mind and your heart and your very being so that the truth of Scripture about death and resurrection and Jesus and his return and the new heavens and the new earth. Let all of this become real for you so that you're not just paying lip service to the idea that death is not our end. And it, so it be it's hard though. But Scott. it it is hard. I know. Yep. Yep. You know, yep. I, I'm, I know myself I'm living with a person that I love who was diagnosed five years ago with cancer. And you're doing fantastic. We just had great blood work again last week. Fantastic. But no matter how strong my faith is, I still get anxious before that blood work comes back. And, and, and the, the biggest reason for that, I think, Patty, is because, you know, some people, if I ask people, why is death the enemy, capital E. Many of them would say, just walking around the street and jumping. Well, <laughs> dude, it's lights out. That's the end, man. Don't go, don't go quiet into that good night. But it's not our end. It's not our end. So in what way is death the capital E enemy? Because it ruptures relationships, right? It separates us from those who love us and those whom we love. Not forever, right? We will all be resurrected, but but for a time, yes. And I think that's, that's what, that, that's what, that's what it is. So, you know, Jesus knows that anxiety and worries are a big problem for us, but he does want us to strive all the time for the kingdom and stry and 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 let some of those worries and anxieties just sort of slough off like i don't know like what like let me slough off dead cells mm, lovely <laughs> lovely <laughs> cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you so sure the New Testament writers talk about anxiety. Why? Because it's common, it's part of the human condition, right? You would so. imagine that even Jesus had anxieties. He had to with all he was going to go through and well, had to. So, you know, you look at him in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Yes. He's, he's sweating blood. Does he want to be crucified? <laughs> he's not an idiot. Of course he doesn't want to be crucified. He wants another way forward but he's willing to follow God's will. But if Jesus and Peter and Paul and the rest didn't urge us to, to cast aside anxiety, um, where would we be? These are all, what are all these? These are all statements about the nature of our life as disciples. And what are the hallmarks of that? We strive to cast aside anxiety. We, we strive to be humble. We strive to be gracious and patient and compassionate. Doesn't mean we always are. If we were, we would be Je Jesus. If we did, if, we, if everybody could and did, we wouldn't have even needed Jesus. All right? We wouldn't need to be rescued from sin if we could easily toss aside sin. Cast all your anxiety in him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Okay? Watch, now you could ask, well, what's that, what's that about? 
I could offer a few suggestions. Peter makes a plain what's on his mind at that moment. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, wake looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. For Peter, the Christians, the, they knew the devil and the f spiritual forces of wickedness are genuine. And that we have to strike a balance. There's two ways we get this wrong. One, we just say, well, that's all kind of that old stuff. And, you know, there's not really any devil or any that kind of thing, you know, demons or any stuff like that that are prowling around the world looking to make us sin or something like that. And that's where a lot of people are. It's where a lot of Christians are. I think it's a mistake. I, I think, you know, I try to point out to them that if you're going to tell me that the devil and demons don't exist, you also have to acknowledge that angels don't. Because the only difference is the angels have chosen for God, the demons have chosen against God. So you can't claim one and get and, and not and not the other. But the other extreme is that Christians, there are some, I've heard them, read them, heard them on the radio sometimes, way a long time ago, where they are just consumed with the idea of spiritual warfare. Every part of their mind and heart every day is in the context of what the devil might do is doing to them at that moment or might do to them in the next moment. That's not healthy either. It's not how, how it is. That, that's almost a denial of God. Peter's just saying, be alert. Be of sober mind. You know, your enemy, the devil's prowling around. They're going to offer you temptations. So, what can I do about that? Be careful where I go, who I hang out with. Nothing good happens after midnight. All that kind of stuff, right? Resist him. Stand firm in the faith. Right? The world is coming at you all the time, telling you, nah, 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 about this Jesus stuff. And you say, oh, yes, we should say, oh, yes, 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 about this Jesus stuff. Right? And that, it, it, and none of it's peculiar to us, Peter, it's writing. It's, this, this is the nature of, of being Jesus' people, this family of believers throughout the world. And, you know, the challenges we face are different. Some Christians are suffering more, some less, some a lot, some not much at all. But we're all part of one family. And so, um, Peter has a large view, I guess, of, of God's work in this world and who the believers are and how God is working through us and I think that's all very healthy. So verse 10. And the God of all grace there's, that's always a big word. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while he, Peter's always acknowledging what these folks are going through. After you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So what do you think he's talking about there? You think he's talking about better days ahead? It's going to be better in a month? He's not talking about it being better in a month. He's talking about the fact you have to take a bigger, truer, longer-term view of who you are and your life. Yes, you're suffering now. It isn't going well. It might never go well in this earthly life. But this earthly life is only a little while. In the scheme of your eternal existence with God, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we step into eternity then. It isn't something we're waiting for. Everything changes. 
who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you suffered a little while, yes, in this life, yes, will himself restore you, resurrect you, make you strong, firm, steadfast. And then he breaks out in a doxology, to him be the power forever and ever, amen. Because for Peter, it's very real, just as it is for Paul, I think. It's just very, very real. They are very confident of what they write, very confident of what they preach, very confident of this portrait of what God is doing in the world and doing with these people and will do. Just very confident of it all. And so they break, Paul does it sometimes. He just breaks into these doxologies. So here's one. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. He could write. Um, and we, what we have to resist is is sort of domesticating it away. I think it happened a lot in the world I grew up in. I grew up in the Bible Belt. It was a, but everybody was a Christian when I grew up, which means what? Everybody wasn't, I'm sorry. I've been doing this a while now. No, no, just because everybody raises their hand and says, I'm a Christian, just because everybody's showing up at church because they want to sell cars on Monday. No, that isn't it. I, I think Stanley Howard Ross is right when he writes that today, right now, in the Christian church, you can look at the numbers of decline and be encouraged because what is happening is the, the church in America is changing. <clears throat> and those who are always hangers-on and not committed and not really believers, well, they're off doing other things. And they, in their view, there was a lot of strength in that. So, okay. How are we doing over there, Patty? We're doing very good. Everybody's being a little quiet right I now. I could, boy, there's a lot of sermons in here, baby. I'm just uh, saying, you know. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of sermons. Maybe it's why we've done two sermon series in the time I've been at St. Andrew, drawn specifically from First Peter. Because there's just, there's a lot there for a preacher to work with. But now we're going to come to the closing of the letter. And not surprisingly, since this is a real letter to real people, um, we just, we just don't, I'll, we just don't know specifically for sure what Peter's talking about. So I will give you, I will give you my opinion. Heck, why not? I'm kind of leading this Bible study, right, honey? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get it anyway. So, verse 12, with the help of Silas, uh, your translation, uh, you're probably looking at the NIV, but if you look at others, it'll say Sylvanus. Sylvanus is merely the Latin form of the name Silas. This is probably, we can't know this for sure, but this is probably the Silas who was a companion of Paul and worked a lot in the church in the early decades. That's my guess. Could be somebody else, but that seems the most likely. Um, and if I were Peter and I had access to Silas, I would use him um, and I would invoke his name to help just let people know that there's a... There's a whole lot of us working in this, and we've been at it for a long time. But look what he says. He says, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly. It's not that brief, is it? No. No, he... <laughs> so do you, does that mean Hy uh, Silas probably penned this? Well, with the help of Silas, I've written to you briefly. So right, Patty, what does it mean? Does it mean that Silas merely carried the letter? Nah, 
Nah, that can't be it. Some couple people have suggested that. No, that. Why would you write? I have written to you with the help of him. I've written to you. Nah, don't think he's carrying. Is he sort of the scribe for Peter, who is basically just sort of taking Peter's dictation down and cleaning it up because Silas might be better with a pen, uh, better with the Greek, and so forth. Maybe, maybe. Silas and Peter sat down, and Peter said, okay, I want to talk about these things. Boom, 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 and Silas took notes, and then Silas went away and composed a letter and brought it back to Peter. You're so bright now because the sun came out. Okay, wow, look at that. <laughs> You're glowing. <laughs> That's how Moses looked when he came out of the tent after meeting with sure God. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> Not that I'm Moses. <laughs> so... um. For my money, I think that Peter relied on Silas to help Peter construct a proper Greek letter. You know, and, and if you read scholars who go through some of these letters, including some of the letters of Paul, they get all caught up in, well, the vocabulary's changed here, and it might not be really from Paul, and maybe this, and maybe that, and he's talking about things that he didn't really talk about earlier. So maybe it's not really, oh, goodness gracious. You know, we don't know how these letters were written. I mean, I, I, could rem I remember a world in which pe business, this principally men at the time, businessmen would sit down at a desk in the morning and dictate to a secretary, almost certainly a woman, who would have a steno pad and use her own particular steno language and take it away, and if they had a really good working relationship, she would actually compose most of the correspondence <laughs> with a, sometimes limited amounts of input, right? So you know, we don't know these things. And so you just, you, what we do know is the early ch church read these, copied them, passed them around, and embraced them as the sacred word of God. That we know. All the rest of it we don't know. That we know. That we know. So, Peter writes, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly. It's not really brief, but he's supposed to be brief, so he claims to be, to be brief. I have written to you briefly, encouraging you, of course, testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Right? Because even they need to be reminded, need to be strengthened. A lot of people, like, let's just take the Gospel of Matthew. Lots of people think that, well, Matthew was written to convince Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. No, probably not. Matthew was, the audience that Matthew has in mind are probably Jewish believers in Jesus who need to be strengthened in the choice that they have made. Don't you feel like sometimes you need to be strengthened in the choice that you have made? I do. I do. I come to the pages of Scripture. I read other Christian writers. I, I have certain places I turn to, but of course there are times because all the time the world is trying to beat us, beat it out of us and convince us that we're naive, uncritical, and kind of stupid. <laughs> Strong letter to follow. So, so Peter says, I'm encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. So stand fast in it. I'm telling you the truth. You can trust me. Stand fast in it. Verse 13. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you. Okay, she who is in Babylon. Whoa, what's that? Well, I wish the she was named. The Babylon is almost certainly a reference to Rome. Almost certainly a reference to Rome. The pagans, the, you know, uh, this is, this is in, in the book of Revelation, uh, this is a lot, there's a lot of this. It's about Babylon, the whore of Babylon. It's Rome, it's Rome, it's Rome, it's Rome. She who is in Rome, because, right, that's where Peter went 
uh, at some point and became the sort of the first the first pope really she who is in babylon she who is in rome chosen together with you sends you her greetings so you almost think that he assumes that they must know who she's talking about and so does my son mark we have no reason to believe that peter had a biological son mark but we do know do believe that john mark from the book of acts the one who actually had a little trouble with paul and got sent home early from the trip um ended up being a companion of peter and i am definitely with those who believe that john mark is the writer of the gospel of mark and that when you come when you read the gospel of mark what you are getting in the gospel of mark is peter's eyewitness testimony peter's with that what what mark gives us is what peter would say and do when he went from place to place to place and told the story of jesus in all the different ways and mark pulls it together into this powerful testimony that can be read or delivered in less than an hour Really? Wow. That, that That's who this is. This is John Mark. What I Go. meant that this could have been done in an hour. <laughs> the Gospel of Mark? I'm kind of joking. You yeah. Know that. Well, yeah. Remember, remember that fellow who came to St. Andrew? Yes. And performed the Gospel of Mark for us? Yep. From beginning to end? Didn't take him much more than an hour to do that. Um, so, so... John Mark is who this probably is, and he calls him my son because he's his son in Christ. He's his companion. He's his protege and, and, and one who is helping Peter get everything done that Peter wants to get done in this life before Peter goes on to the next one. She who is in Babylon in, in Rome, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of what? Of love. In this case, not a holy kiss. We come across that, but a kiss of love. It's just a it's 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 just a, a final bened, benediction of sorts. You know, greet one another with a kiss of love. The love we have in Christ, the love we have for each other. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. There's a f funny idea. Not funny. It's not funny. It's just. It's just common. It, it, we don't stop and think about it enough. What does it mean to be in Christ? What does it mean to participate in Christ? Right? It means <laughs> something profound. Okay? Something profound. And it's, and, and it's used a lot um, by Paul, by Peter. Peace to all of you who are in Christ, who have put your faith in Christ. And so now that you have put your faith in Christ, you participate in Christ, his sufferings are your sufferings, your sufferings are his sufferings, he has been crucified, you have been crucified, he has been resurrected, you have been resurrected. What is true of Jesus is true of you. Wow. That's a lot of theology carried by a few words, but that's what it is. Peace to all, peace to all of you who are in Christ. And so, um, again, it's, it's a challenge for us to really wrap our minds and hearts around that. But the New Testament writers want us to. That's why we have to come together and talk about these things. Because where else are we going to talk about these things? It's hard to do in sermons. Most of what you're going to find on TV or on YouTube is... I don't talk about these things. Academics sometimes will, but, you know, they're often pretty darn hard to understand. Even Paul is pretty hard to understand. Um, but, so, anyway. And there, Peter's letter to the churches in Asia Minor, slash Turkey, um, ends. So, there we go. 
Alrighty. So, any final things over there, baby? I see. What time is it? It is almost 4.15. I get. I timed that pretty well, didn't you I? You sure did. That's kind of amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing I have a clock here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, when we come together a week from Monday. Right. Not Tuesday. A week from Monday, we are going to move over a little later in the New Testament, a little earlier in the New Testament, I should say, and we're going to do First Timothy, followed by Second Timothy and Titus, these letters from Paul to really the next generation. That's right. Um, so, and we're going to meet. We're going to meet people. We're going to meet Eunice, right, and stuff. So, yeah. That's what we'll do. It'll it's cool. 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 Yeah. Cool. There's a very <laughs> word that cool it's a word I use too much, I have to say. I have to get rid of that. I have to find some substitute for it, but it's a good catch all. It is. It is. In twenty twenty one. Yeah. <laughs> You're cool. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Lauren is, I think, watching. She's probably oh cracking up about yeah. the coolness of Scott. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we're it. so glad you went through this whole book with us. Really? Right. You exactly. Know? So. It's a good study. Yeah, it, it is. A good it's study. a good. And uh, the letter is brief enough that you could just sit down sometime and just kind of read through it all and just kind of remind yourself and, and just what we talked about and, and let it become that's right ever more real that's right so okay i'm going well, to turn it over to we you we hope you all have a wonderful labor day weekend we would have actually probably had no class on monday anyway yeah because it is labor, it's day. labor day we wouldn't day, have so had it monday anyway. we hope you have a nice long weekend and we'll see you the week after that um if you come to Scott's class on Sunday, even though we won't be there, Lauren will be there and she'll be doing an amazing job. Um, She's teaching on the theology of some of the hymns in our oh, hymnal. That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it will be really good. It will be. Especially anybody yeah. who has a music background, please yeah, it's, tune in. It's just, I know you'd be amazed by job. how much theology is carried in yes. these hymns. Yep. Right? Yes. So anyway, thanks for being with us over these past couple months as we've uh, gone through this study, and we hope to see you in a few weeks when we do start Timothy. And um, I'm going to just close in prayer. I did have one prayer request that came over from the Brewers. Um, they would like us to pray specifically for some friends and family of their, theirs in New Orleans right now. And I know many of us may have people that we know in New Orleans uh, seeing the pictures around noon when they were finally able to get into some areas. Um, the devastation, devastation is but unbelievable. But gratefully, grateful, no, no big flooding. The, Which, the levees yes. all appear to have held. Yes. So, But it's a very big city. More than a million people have no electricity, and they don't really have any idea when it's going to come wow, on. It's and crazy. you know how hot and sticky and... Uh, just yeah so we're just going to pray for everybody not only in new orleans but the whole area as the storm makes its way um you know up through our country and all the coastlines that it has hit we just we do pray lord that um people will be able to you know get help quickly um get their stuff restored um I, i've been blessed to never know that kind of devastation so please join me. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the study that we all went through over the past couple months on Peter. And we thank you, God, for helping us to understand better your word. We do pray, God, for the catastrophic conditions right now that are left behind by Hurricane Ida. And we pray, God, for healing um, for all those that are involved. What a, what a devastating storm. And Lord, we also pray as our country closes a 20-year 20 20 year war in Afghanistan today. Just a few minutes ago, I got posts both from CNN and Fox News that the last military plane has left Afghanistan. I think most of us thought that wasn't going to happen till tomorrow, but it's done. It's done. And we just pray, God, for all those that are left behind, all those that are still stranded and need to get out of Afghanistan. We pray, God, 
We just pray, God, that you will hold these people close and, God, let them feel your presence every moment. We know that they've got a lot of, of pain in, you know, just in the future. And uh, we just pray, God, that, that we will be able to rescue those who need to be rescued. Lord, please hold us close for the rest of this day. We pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would be with us, that we'd feel his presence. And we pray, God, that that Holy Spirit right now would lift up all of our joys and concerns to you, Lord. Thank you, God, for being such a faithful, loving, merciful Lord. And we lift up all these prayers in the name of your risen Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Patty. Bye, friends. Adios, everybody. See you two See weeks. See you all in two weeks. Bye. Bye-bye.